Hello to you all. Thank you for all coming. Thank you to the Zoomers. Um, let's just jump right in here. Um, I, I assume you know what a pitch is. I'm not here to tell you what the content of your pitch should be. I assume you know some version of this, that you're trying to describe the problem, the market, uh, and introduce the team, et cetera. And these are the things that should be in the video pitch. Uh, and your pitch should tell a story. I'm sure you've heard these things and those requirements that we just talked about are usually the structure for your story. So I am not going to talk in great detail about the content of the pitch, but I did want to talk about my goals for today and maybe uh, a touch of being mindful of scripts that you hear versus read. Um, I would like to help you better present your team and I would like you to... Uh, visualize your idea in some way and that's usually through a slide deck uh, and we'll talk about slide decks um, and maybe maybe some of you are, are aspiring to visualize beyond slides and we can talk about that too because i think you should best take advantage of the video format if you're going to give somebody a, a three four or five minute video uh take advantage of that format to the max you might have seen my tongue-in-cheek subtitle uh, another big inspiration for the talk today is I feel like everybody is just submitting Zoom videos now. They're just hitting, they're sharing their slides, they're recording on Zoom, and they hit record, and then that's what they share. And I'd I'd like to think that we could do better. Um, you could do a lot worse too, but I think we could do better. So let's talk about uh, this idea. I, I stole this from a podcasting, a, a book about if you want to make your own podcast, and I give her a credit on the next slide, but I just wanted to call out this idea that when you're speaking to the camera, you probably don't want to speak like this. This is a beautiful paragraph, and I'll read some of it just so we can hear how beautiful it is. A popular accordionist and jazz flute performer at local cafes in his college days, John Smith, now 32, has entered a new phase in his life that is not uncommon among aspiring musicians over the age of 30. Sure, if I'm reading that, it sounds great in my mind, but it's a little bit of a mouthful and it's a, a little bit difficult to understand uh, in audio form. And... Kristen Meinzer in her book points out, this is the rewritten version of that same paragraph that I just said. And I bring this up just because I thought it brilliantly showed a before and after of a script that if you're mindful that you have to say it, people have to hear it and they have to process it in a different kind of way than reading. Um, so that's just uh, my spiel there. And this is an excellent book. It, it's obviously about starting a podcast, but I feel like it's uh, a media savvy book in general that I highly recommend. And there's a, there's a lot of good stuff there, even just being aware of how, it, how, how to work with the media, et cetera, in the future. So what should a good video do? It should guide the viewer's attention. Um, this is another big theme. Um, I see people slide decks, I see videos, and I feel like there's just often too much information on certain slides sometimes. I'm guilty of this too. We're all guilty of this. I just want to call our attention to it. Um, you know, I often see slides that have sort of a step one through seven grand plan or steps one through four of how you assemble your IKEA furniture. This is this is meant to represent your brilliant ideas. This is just a placeholder for that, those brilliant ideas. And they often, they are brilliant. It's just that when you see all of the steps at once, it can be overwhelming. I would argue this does not best take advantage of the video format. So in your version of your pitch where you're talking about phase one, phase two, phase three, or milestone one, two, three, four, whatever your version of that is, you know, don't do this. Give those things the presence they deserve. Show them and take advantage of the format and give each of them the weight they deserve, give them the time they deserve, take full advantage of the video format and focus my attention. That's the main thing I'm trying to say with this is that this is guiding my attention through that process. And these are just the same old slides in PowerPoint, Keynote, whatever. Google Slides does this, all these animations also. And uh, that I feel is one big big takeaway I hope to bestow upon you that I get tired of seeing slides that just have entirely too much on one of them. And I wish it was broken out into more where you just show them over time instead of talking to one slide for too many minutes. 
Another big inspiration for this, I recently attended Adobe Max, and they uh, do a really good job on certain presentations. A lot of them fall into this format now, and I want to play some of it for you now, if my computer will cooperate. Is and how you can use I have him muted a little bit so I can talk over him. The impact of social media. But this was one of the sessions that they uh, on video, and I feel like this is becoming more norm for this kind of context. And I could imagine that this is a video pitch. Even though he's teaching uh, in this one, you know, it's, it's letting me connect with him on a more personal level. I can see him even sometimes. Uh, I can see his slides and I can see him full screen. You know, when, when I need to be able to read the content, I go big. And when I really need to connect with him, that can also go big. This is very simple editing, uh, but very effective. And there's really just basically three shots here, full-size speaker, full-size slides, and side-by-side. -side. So today, I'm going to do some version of these three edits with you live in a variety of different software and answer your questions as I bravely try to do some of these some of these things live. Any thoughts or questions on what we've seen or heard so far to help me better focus what I do and say from this point forward? Anything? Hopefully the Zoom people can talk over the speakers if they, I have it set to go to Crest John. All right, so assuming you're with me so far and you agree with most of what I've said, um, at some point, you do have to gather your media. Now, what's media? That's you recording yourself giving your talk to a camera. It could be the laptop camera. It could be grab my show and tell. It could be your smartphone. We all have amazing cameras now. There's just no way around it. We have amazing cameras in our pocket. Sometimes we just need a little $15 thing to stick them on to, to, to actually, you know, make the video that we get from that amazing camera uh, more useful. And I'll show the folks on Zoom. These are all on Amazon for anywhere. This is just a selfie stick that happens to have the ability to also become a little tabletop tripod. And these these cost anywhere between $10 and $20. And I know most of you have access to ones at some point. And I would recommend to use them. I done I did some demos here today using the built-in laptop camera and this laptop's pretty new and the laptop uh, camera built in is pretty good, but older laptops aren't so great. So where you record these things is key. You know, you can't do it next to traffic, can't do it outside. Those are pretty obvious. You gotta get yourself close to whatever microphone you're using. If the mic in the phone is your main microphone or the mic in your laptop is the main source, uh, then just be as close to it as reasonably possible. Um, this used to be a much bigger issue and tech has come a long way this in this way we used to have to rely on other microphones and other things and of course those things are still used in the professional video world but i'm trying to make this about what can you do with either your laptop and your cell phone or one or the other assuming you do not have time to deal with bigger video cameras bigger microphones xlr cables etc cetera, etc cetera. So the first thing I wanna do is talk about this idea of using your video from your smartphone in conjunction with some, some video that you captured of your screen. But let's talk about that second part, screen capture. Yeah, I wanted to give a little visual on this. So for people who couldn't quite see my little tripod, there's all these kinds of ways to get what I call a tabletop setup in place. Some kind of, the one on the right actually looks a lot like the one I have. But let's talk about screen capture. You can do this on Mac and Windows. I'm sure you can do this on Linux as well. I'm not gonna stand up here and pretend to know everything about Windows. I definitely have been using a Mac for enough years now where I, I obviously am biased that way, um, but I did look into it. And there are two great that I can verify, and there's a billion tutorials out there, but I can verify that these two sources actually provide quality content. Um, how to how to capture a video on a Mac, similar to what I'm going to do here in a minute, as well as uh, I want to give a shout out to Kevin Stratvert and his channel. Um, a lot of great content there, really good teacher, and uh, goes through the steps on how to do it on Windows 11 using the game bar. 
And uh, as you can see in the graphic there, uh, it, once you get it working, I don't have a mouse pointer, but as you get it working, it's it's uh, I feel like it's almost as easy as, as the Mac version. And in fact, the key command on the Mac version, I feel like is a little bit techy compared to how Macs used to be. Was that shift command five. And there's an app built into every Mac. This is where I'm not sure if this is on Windows, but I assume it is called Photo Booth. And um, you can actually record the Photo Booth source. And this is if you do it entirely on your, on your laptop. So I have a little demo video of me here kind of doing this live the other day in a coffee shop just to prove sort of a proof of concept here. Because truth be told, I do use big cameras and big microphones. I don't use my laptop to do this. So I'm over there pretending to give a talk. You hear the coffee shop sound. I would be talking, but I'm not talking. You saw me go up and uh, share my screen full screen. And what I had done was actually hit screen record. And that photo booth app is also running in the background. So when I'm done here, I'm going to have everything you see here on this side in a video file. And I'm showing you this photo booth video already cropped here in Keynote side by side. This is uh, this is just the raw, unvarnished truth of, of me going through the whole process there. And that last thing I clicked told the, the built-in screen capture on the Mac to stop capturing the screen. So that was my raw material. I have junk at the beginning and I have junk at the end, but the parts in the middle have been captured now. I want to talk about that for a second. Um, because you're going to need to take that into a video editor. And I want to encourage you that this actually saves you time instead of making you more work. I feel like the stress of having to nail perfectly your pitch when you record with Zoom, the moment you mess up, you have to start over. Uh, and maybe after you've done the pitch now eight times, you're starting to wilt. And you really wish you could have used takes two and takes three, but you kind of messed up in some way and you need to get it all the way from the beginning to the end. Why do it eight times when you could edit it together? Um, you could even edit your Zoom MP4s the way I'm about to go over here, but, but why even do that when you can use source like we saw here? So these are very popular video editors. These are not the only six in the world. These are the popular ones. I'm familiar with the ones on the left. I prefer to use Final Cut Pro, but I've been happy to use Adobe Premiere. We all have access to that in all the CMU computer labs. You can sign into any of the computer labs, Windows or Mac, and use Adobe Premiere. I also like this tool called ScreenFlow, although that is a $100 or $125 tool, something like that. It's been worth every penny. I, don't, I do not work for that company. I do not get sponsors from that company, but I will just give them a shout out. The three on the right are free, and these are pretty new. Um, the one I'm going to show today is VN Editor. CapCut is made by the same people that make TikTok, uh, and they actually have made a pretty, pretty awesome free video editor from what I can see. But the but I uh, downloaded the VN one to demo today. DaVinci Resolve is actually probably the most professional of all the tools up here, and ironically, it's for free. It's made by Blackmagic Design. They make a lot of excellent cameras and other video production equipment, and they basically just want anybody who buys their cameras to have super good video editing software. And I would actually argue that it rivals the professionalism of, uh, of Premiere and Final Cut Pro and maybe is the most professional tool up here and free, but also has the steepest learning curve. Um, so let's talk about these things. There's some truth to all those uh, software that you just saw. They're all the same, but unfortunately, they're all different. So it's true. Both are true. They just move things around on you. But a lot of the concepts are the same. So let's dig into uh, VN Editor here. I'm going to show it in slide land before we go over to live demo land, just to make sure that these get seen. This is a screenshot of the VN Editor in action here. And you see all of the standard parts of the video editing software. You see an area where your raw clips are there to the left and they call that my stock you know in another tool they might call it my sources they might call it footage 
those are your original media clips and you can see there are there's a photo booth one and a screen recording one there on the on the bottom uh every video editor, editing software that i would recommend has some kind of timeline zero being on the left time going off to the right until you're done and if it has some ability to do layering in other words video can be stacked on itself or scaled uh, that that's that's my bar for okay. It's actually worth your time. It's not just one of these sort of social media editing tools that's encouraging you to make five second clips or or whatever. Um, this this is tuned into the social media world, just as is as is CapCut, but they actually provide you a, a pretty remarkably free tool here, where you can do. I tried to get it to do many things that I do in Final Cut, and I and I succeeded. So you can see there's a little title there. Uh, I was able to do cutting, I was able to do scaling, I was able to move them around, and I'm going to do that live, but again, I have a, a result video of from made from the ones we just saw a second ago. I was able to put a title in, I was able to, again, scale and move, I was able to synchronize when I wanted the slides to show up with my voice, and just sort of prove that it was all possible. And what I love about this video that uh, that Zoom would not be able to do, those look like crap on the Zoom recording. Zoom throws away, you know, 70% of those frames. You don't see smooth transitions. Uh, the audio is gonna be much lower quality after it gets put through the extreme Zoom compression. Even if you set your Zoom recording to some of the uh, less, uh, less uh, what's the word, compressed or uh, uh, efficient sound codecs, it, it's, uh, it's still gonna sound worse than what you would do in this case. And there's another demo here of full screen video with with scaled slides, which is another nice style that we didn't see in the Adobe one. So like I mentioned, I work a lot in Final Cut Pro. This is like a project that I did recently that spotlighted a robot uh, that was, the, the goal of this robot was to, to uh, uh, get lantern fly egg sacs off of trees. And it was a, it was a, it was a team of undergraduates, graduate students, PhD students, and faculty. And uh, this, this I, I show this to you just to more show the structure of a timeline um, where there's some introductory titles there at the left. And every time you see one of these little pieces, these little boxes, those are clips of media. Um, I shot these folks on a green screen. I don't expect anybody to do their pitch video on a green screen. And that's, that's how I'm able to put coal on some kind of graphic background. Um, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Uh, with and without a green screen nowadays. Uh, so I just want to call that out that he was not actually filmed on this uh, tartan that was just a green screen. This is a close up of the timeline just to appreciate the complexity here. Now this is a three minute, three minute and 50 second video or whatever. And, uh, and you know, there's a lot going on here. I don't think pitch videos look like this. You saw what pitch video looks like. Um, they look a little bit more uh, less busy than that kind of timeline, but we are going to go into Final Cut and play with that. So being comfortable with some basic editing lingo so that you can understand whenever you are put in front of the video editing software that you choose. You know, a lot of these things go by different names in these tools. Like you saw, it was called, uh, I, I keep wanting to call it sources. It was called, what, what was it called in, uh, in VN? Quiz. Was it just sources? my sources yeah you know uh like you'll you'll see them called bins you'll see them called media bins what was it my stocks right right you'll see them called things like my bins that's a more pro ter term because it goes back to the old days when when they would actually cut film and they were kept in these big bins um you know that's like an archaic term now but you'll you'll still see that in like avid and you'll see that in in final cut um but this idea of Layers, scaling, positioning, these are the Googleable words. Like, how do I scale my layer in blank video editor? So that, you know, uh, I think half the time people just don't know what the right keyword is to Google. You know, how do I trim? How do I cut? Where's the transitions panel? Because they might not call it transitions. They might call it the effects panel or the cool panel or whatever they call it. And this idea of synchronization, I think it's just another word, this idea of like, I want to make sure that my audio is in sync with my video. And if you see that word floating around, that's just synchronized. Uh, luckily, a lot of these tools will automatically synchronize things for you, which is, which is nice.
So, right, let's hop out here. I think that's the the end of slides, and we can we can go out here and actually play with these things. Please do. I'll bring up bring up VN and ask away. That's a great question. So I've given a talk, a version of this talk years past, and hopefully they're still online somewhere. But yes, what you have behind you can is something you should definitely be at least aware of. Uh, doing it against a stark blank white wall. Sure, that's safe but that's really kind of bland, right? So yes, if you want to do it in a, a space where uh, you could put something in the, in the background, like the guy who gave the Adobe Max talk, he's just, he's doing it from somewhere where you see his like office workspace and stuff behind him. Um, absolutely. And I, again, I, I think that a green screen is not the right thing to do for a pitch video, but it's also, if it's something you're interested in, talk to me because you could be talking and behind you is some kind of B-roll, uh, relevant B-roll to your to your domain. You know, um, I do think that the automatic effects that try to auto isolate the subject in the way Zoom does that horrible blur, I would recommend turning that off. Like if you are still going to take everything I say here today and say, that's nice, but I'm still doing it in Zoom, which I'm just going to end with. But I will I will tease that one now. Turn off the auto blur background. Make sure the angle of your laptop is not shooting up your nose. <laughs> you know, some real basic stuff like that. That I assume now that we've been through what we've been through the last few years, everybody's gotten more Zoom savvy. Um, the idea of having a ring light or doing it where there's a window facing you um, so that you have some kind of natural light falling on you goes back to your question. Yes, in a dream world, and again, if you look at these talks I've given over the years, I think maybe I was dreaming too big yeah, you definitely would be trying to set up something that puts you in more of the context. Some, um, I, but, I, but you also did say something very wise, like you don't want your background to, to compete for their attention or to have things that move in your background that distract. So avoid like that. All right, so I'm going to play this for you here, but we're going to make this one live just to give you a sense of how VN works. And my original source, like I like I proved to you um, over here, you know, I had my photo booth video, and I have my screen recording, and I've imported these into VN by simply dragging them into this my stock area. So they're in there, and I'm not going to do that now. But that's just all you do: you drag and drop them into here. Um, I'm going to start a new timeline. And let's go to town here. I'm going to bring down the slides first. You actually drag and drop in this one to either insert it, replace, cover, um, and that inserts it where the playback head was. Um, I, for the longest time, I'm used to Final Cut. I was trying to click here because in Final Cut, that's how you jump around to get to places in time. Notice it does not work. It took me a minute to realize that I just two fingers scroll this area to move myself through time. So like I said, they're all the same and they're all different. And this one got me for a few minutes. So you do not just click around, you literally slide your, your media back and forth. And this is the unedited clip. And let's say I know that I wanted to start right around here because that's where the actual screen share is large. Um, that's where I'm going to put my playback head. I also want to call out that this tool is really trying to be uber flexible. Uh, flexible. I'm so used to working in a world of video that everything is 16 by 9. This is a standard video shape of our television sets and most cameras default to if you're shooting horizontally this shape. Um, we live in a world now where these other formats are just as relevant as this one. So take this with a grain of salt. I, I don't think uh, 
anybody would argue that your video is bad if you delivered it in these other formats, as long as it shows what it needs to show. I am most used to using the classic frame, um, but I could, argue, I could argue that you could make an excellent pitch video in a square. I'm gonna work in 16 by nine. Now you notice I dragged my video in here, which was made by my webcam, and it was not a 16 by nine. It was, I believe, four three. So it defaulted this timeline to what it called original. The first thing I brought in there, whatever that is, it assumes that's what I want my shape to be. I can just change this now on the fly to be a 16 nine uh, space. So I just wanna call that out. Um, my playback head is here. There is a question. Sorry, yes, sir. The the video, from what I can tell, was being forced to uh, to be scaled to the height, and it then extended uh, based on scaling to height again. So I do not I do not think it is um, uh, warping the video in any way that I'm concerned about. Yeah, that's a that's exactly right. It it gave me some real estate to work with here that technically has no video. And these slides just happen to be on black. Take that with a grain of salt. Maybe that's a good move, maybe that's a bad move, but this this slide deck from last year's talk was what I used. And uh yeah, so it's it's just conforming it to be the 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 correct height and creating that space there. It's good that I clicked on it though, because I, I do have every intention of showing you how to actually scale this to start to mimic what we saw in the Adobe piece, you know, to, uh, you know, to start, start getting ready for bringing in the face. And that's probably scaled a little, a little too much. And I'm going to come down here with this highlighted and there is hiding out down here in my tools. They call it split. So you'll see some tools call it split. You see some tools call it cut. Uh, sometimes they have the scissors icon. Again, this goes back to the days where film was cut with razor blades. These, these, you know, no one's using the scissors anymore, right? Um, but I split my clip. This is the part I want to get rid of. It's highlighted by default. I press delete. It's gone. Okay. So I have uh, generally the beginning of where I want my video to be. I'm going to go back to my stocks here and find here. Now, this is my clip. And sometimes the way you, you know, you know, the way you do this, there's audio in both clips and you try to find where they, where they match up. In this one, there's no audio. So this is, this is, this is a little bit cheating just for the sake of teaching some editing basics. Um, but what I'm getting at here is that uh, in other tools too, you can choose to choose up here before you even drag down where you want it to begin. Like if you already know that all this is junk, I'd press the I key or I would choose some version of the endpoint there. Um, in this case, they don't want to make this tool that complex. They just want you to bring the whole thing down. Um, and the way they the way they do it is 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 um, and I'm just going to go straight to the beginning. And if I click and drag over top of this, one of the choices here is overlay. Um, and it will overlay that on top. So you have to ask yourself about the workflow here. Should I have brought in the image of me speaking first and then overlay the slides over top of it? Or, or does it matter? Uh, or should I bring in the video uh, in this order? Let's, let's see what happens here. All right. Um, all video editors have some way to scale your view of the timeline. So you can go in very, very, very close or you can come out very, very, very far um because these clips are several minutes long right um here is the video i just brought in and i can scale it accordingly too but since i'm overlaying it it's on top of my slides so i would have to decide how i want to deal with that in some tools you could crop this clip you could literally say chop off the pixels on the edge uh, and that might be good enough but actually in this situation i would say bringing them in in the opposite order will probably make my life easier. And that's unique to this tool. In Premiere, I think the order we did it here would actually work. So this is not that big of a deal. Um, it's it's lovely that I can come down here and choose these things and, and get rid of them. Or can I get rid of them? 
we're learning together. Yeah, what I want to do is press delete on this, but I guess since this is the original clip, it's like, no, I want that to be there forever. That's okay. I will discard this project, start a new project. And in this tool, it already has things I've imported before. A lot of video editing tools will really start you from scratch where I would have to re-import my clips into here. This, is, this tool is saying, well, you've used a bunch of this stuff before. Maybe you still want it. Uh, that's, this is, that's why this is not a professional tool. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring down my face first. And let's assume that's where I'm, I'm starting it. I'm going to cut. I can move this around, by the way, or I can scale it. And my argument being that any of these tools that give you the ability to move and scale and layer your media meet, meet my criteria. This tool is adding in an interesting little, a little thing without me having to do anything. It's being mindful that probably I'm a social media person using, using this tool. And notice how it's creating this uh, blurred background version of the content. There's probably a setting somewhere in VN that says turn that off, but it's on by default. Actually, I don't mind it because uh, it's nice uh, to have uh, something fill those pixels, even if they are not, um, uh, you know, visible it's just it's it's adding some kind of interest to them um i split the clip before but i wanted to come in here and do this again to say that i also can grab the edge of these clips and i can do what's called a trim so these are this is a manual trim whereas i cut it or split it and delete the part deleted the part that i want you can grab these handles and adjust where your clip is beginning and ending. And it's telling me exactly where it's beginning. This is, this is why I was pretty impressed by this free tool. It's like, oh, exactly 20.98 seconds into the clip, that's where it's actually starting. And that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and scale this down. And put this here. And this is a matter of tweaking things until they, until they feel right for you. It all depends on your content and what your sources are. But for, for the sake of this and me trying to mimic the, the Adobe Max look and feel, you know, even though this is not perfectly uh, scaled and fitting right here, as you saw, it is possible to do that. I'd argue that even if you submitted your entire video pitch like this, it's better than the way Zoom does it by default. I mean, do you all remember how Zoom does it? I have seen some video up in the corner be smaller than a postage stamp. The slide is dominating the view and the person goes off on a tangent and decides to talk about something for five minutes. And it doesn't have anything to do with the slide that they left up. Now you're looking at this postage stamp video or you're just listening at that point. Obviously audio is probably the most important part of your pitch and and that is why ultimately you want to make sure that it, that it sounds really good but it's so frustrating when if they had just had the ability to stop sharing their screen show me their face and then go back to sharing their screen but zoom is not that smart i believe if you screen share with at any point it makes you a version of the video where the screen is shared the whole time i could be wrong on that but that's been my experience with most zoom videos you just see the slides dominating the screen the entire time Whereas I do believe a big part of pitching is to let me see who's pitching. This also brings into this idea that people have tried to do multiple people talking during Zoom. Um, again, that adds complexity to a Zoom call. Why not just have them do their part? Hi, I'm Brian and I'm on the media team. Back to the, the CEO. You know, uh, we don't have to be orchestrating this all in some elaborate Zoom call when everybody could just record their individual clips and give them to the person who's working in a tool like this to, to compile them. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's play with this here. Let's actually do a little bit uh, of other cutting here where we where we change the scene. So 
at this moment right here, I will have this be. Question about this real quick. Yes, sir. Um, we have to think about the aspect ratios that we're filming the video in to the like, Germany suggestions. Yes, yes. The what, what my brain immediately went to was I work with some scientists of all different ages and and, and media savvy levels, and they're off doing a video a demo of their robot. And they're like, well, Brian, okay, you film it, but we're also going to film it. So when I'm done, I get some people shot it with an iPhone 10 at a horizontal orientation. Some people shot it with an iPhone 15, but they shot it portrait. Uh, I would say for a pitch video, you should take some control over it. Like if everybody on the team wants to do a portrait style, because you know, ultimately you're just trying to stick it like this, shoot it that way. I kind of did myself a little bit of a, of an annoying thing here. I could have said, well, okay, fine. All of the people will be in portrait because I, my plan is to always show them in this context. But the moment that I want to show it like this, and I keep clicking instead of sliding, then I'm going to have to zoom in on this portrait orientation. So yes, aspect ratio is important. And you only can deliver your video in one aspect ratio. Um, and that's why we live in this world now where things have become a little bit more square because they're, they're good for people who like it horizontal and they're good for people who like to hold their phone portrait. Um, and then these other ones are more like, definitely more cinematic formats. Uh, could you give some context to your question? Yeah, so I guess we're trying to put two videos together and then we want them to fit into the aspect ratio like 16. Right. Um, and I noticed you're kind of like cropping and stuff here. So I guess I'm wondering- A scaling, a scaling at this point. Yes, yes. So I guess my question is actually related to that. Like how much can we scale? An aspect region to get it to fit versus is there one image should be recorded the wrong way and we just can't see? You can always force it, but like I think the main thing is if you try to take a, a portrait oriented robot demo and cut it against one that's shot horizontal, it's painfully obvious. So like if you were to scale that portrait one up to feel your horizontal pixels because you delivered in this, then yeah, you're not going to be happy. Uh, the amount of pixels may allow you to actually put it in at 100% and not lose quality. That's the other thing I should say is that, that this video is going to be shared at a what's called default HD size, which is 1920 by 1080. Most of our cameras now are shooting double that amount of pixels. Uh, so if you were getting video in a variety of formats, but you delivered in 1920 by 1080, then all of your stuff will scale within that. And, and this, this tool was optimized to deal, I think, with the, with the chaotic world that does exist of different formats. I plopped it in, it auto, it auto put a background in for me and blurred it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but as you'll see, the other tools like Final Cut aren't gonna be as, as charitable. It's assuming more from me. Whereas this tool is saying, I'm gonna help you as much as I can. I, I was actually impressed by this tool. For a free tool, this, uh, this is better than iMovie. I used to say, well, you could use iMovie. And I actually think this tool was easier to use than iMovie, which is, uh, you know, just a, a big compliment to it. And I'm gonna just make sure that we continue the... And you can see I've even I've even cropped that for whatever reason, and that may be relevant to what is being done. I'm not getting into dissolves. You can come down here and add in dissolves between these moments, but I will say, as a person who teaches editing, and again, this is a crash course in it today. We're doing it for just thirty or forty minutes, right? Um, one of the biggest lessons that I that I that I've learned and and that I will that I will tout is. The most powerful transition is the cut. And you'll see if you really pay attention, most of the time the world we live in is cuts and not fancy dissolves and other fancy weird wipes and transitions. They're fun sometimes. Sometimes they have they have relevance, but I would actually argue in a pitch video, you should limit yourself to cuts. They're the least distracting and they're also 
probably arguably the, the cleanest and most professional looking. Um, so don't 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 diss the the common cut. Uh, it's it's still the champion. And pay attention to things like you see, I have not moved this over far enough, and it's revealing a little bit of my thing below it. So those kind of things are important to to check. You know, render it out, make sure that it's uh, working. And in the case of this tool, it's pretty easy. You um you literally come up to export and it's going to give you some options here again this this typical size is the, is the 1920 by 1080 this is the horizontal lines of resolution and then uh my video was originally at 30 frames most things are but even if you shoot it at higher frame rates with a newer and better iphone you could still deliver at 30 frames 20 megabits per second is uh the amount of compression it will still look great uh it's giving you an estimated size of uh, does it say on this screen? It does not, but I did a little test and you could see that those things were actually still relatively small. They were, uh, you could, you could argue that if I were to go back and if I was putting that much effort into my pitch video, I might, I might double this to 40. There's no reason to max this out. Um, so at some point, uh, giving it a huge amount of data per second is just making your file bigger than it really needs to be. Um, but I would say like a five minute video, if it ends up being 500 megabytes, that's the biggest it should be. And then you hit export and it saves it out to this location. Let's hop over to Final Cut. Give you a little taste of what's going on over here. This was an undergraduate student. Uh, we have designed a project which aims to address the spotted lanternfly issue, which especially impacts farmers since they tend to go for economically important crops like hardwoods, ornamentals, and grapevines. This problem especially impacts our local region of Pennsylvania, where it has the potential to drain over 300 million from the economy annually which is why we have developed a robotic solution to this problem with the potential to lower the economic and social impacts of the spotted. So she was very nervous, as you may be able to tell, and I did my best to edit, <laughs> but this was a particularly bit of challenging, a uh, little bit of challenging editing because she definitely got nervous and she had to do it many times. So even though I was able to get my way through it and cut to the robot and cut to different things and, and try to de-emphasize her nervousness. I, I'm still painfully aware of how nervous it, it, that she still seems. Um, but I did my best. And what I, I show this to you to mainly say, you know, get, get comfortable in front of the camera, do a few that, that you know you're going to throw away, and then try to relax as best as you can. Because some people get really nervous talking to a camera. Um, I think a lot of you, I get the sense that you're pretty comfortable talking to groups of people. Any of you clam up when you talk to a to a camera? Is that different than talking to a, a group of people? You seem pretty confident in this area. I just get that vibe. Uh, so, and she's more of a scientist and she wasn't used to, to doing that. And she's very young and, and didn't have much experience talking to, to cameras yet. Um, so I I just wanted to to call out this idea of you can you could even brand your piece at the beginning. You can import uh some kind of graphic that represents your piece. I also wanted to call out this other shot that you see here from, this is from a source that I highly recommend you tap into if you, um, if you, if it's relevant to your, to your piece, it's this site called Pexels and they offer um, free video B-roll of a, on a variety of things. So in the case of the lantern flies attacking grape orchards, I Google or I search for grape orchards here in, in videos. And, you know, I find that clip and I, I say, hey, scientists, is this clip good enough? They're like, yeah, where'd you get that? I was like, yeah, got it on text. So someone, someone shot a video uh, of, of even something as simple as uh, grapes being grown, in a, in a, you know, in a, you know, on a grapevine. Um, you can find all kinds of cool stuff in there. Um, I find videos like this that I teach uh, with and edit or, or do motion tracking and all kinds of stuff with a lot of really beautiful stuff and it's free. Uh, you should just give them a little shout out, you know, maybe uh, credit them in some way. Uh, but uh, I just want to call out Pexels not for, for stock video and images. 
um, you can put a title card at the end. The other thing I didn't really uh, do live here that I should jump back is uh, I gave myself a little title in here, um, you know, and this was one of the more interesting things where I muddled my way through how it was different than Final Cut because uh, in Final Cut, you know, if I want to make a title, uh, this probably looks equally daunting to you, but it's just that it's what I'm used to. Like I knew to come up here. I knew to find my lower thirds. I knew to find this title and put her name and title in there and then drag and drop that down to the timeline where it looks like this. Uh, throw me, and this is years and years and years of video editing experience, throw me into a brand new tool. And it was humbling because I was like, well, how do you do it in this tool? You know, where is it? Uh, you know, and I, and I'm like finding like titles. I'm looking, I'm looking for uh, lower thirds. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find anything I can uh, that is what I want. And I did find that uh, I eventually found what you saw in that other, in that other piece. I wonder which one I used here. Yeah, I just found a basic title. And then I taught myself that this tool even has the ability to move it around with these things called keyframes, where you can actually say, uh, you, you, you see, when I click on something, it's saying, if you want to add a keyframe, well, when I was right here and I can, I can't, I think these are, these are meant to be made and then moving on, but I'll, I'll make a new keyframe here um, where it's a point of change. So if I were to move this up, uh, it's, it comes in, it moves up to where I just moved it to, it moves back down and then fades away. So maybe I stumbled on a happy accident of a title that I actually think is pretty cool. I don't think that's that cool, but I just wanted to say that that is, that is how easy it is to, uh, even in this free tool, move things around. And most tools, like I teach a class at Adobe After Effects where keyframes is the main thing that you have to learn to get comfortable with Adobe After Effects. Uh, it's a motion design tool where things go from point A to point B, and these keyframes represent those points. They're points of change. Um, so that is not necessarily to say I'm going to teach you an exhaustive way of, 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 of managing keyframes. It's my way of continuing to sort of give this VN free editing tool a shout out as, wow, you even have keyframes built in? That's not something I'm used to seeing in a free tool. And pretty sure again that that's not in in iMovie. Um, in Final Cut, which is not to be confused with iMovie, um, you can keyframe as well. It's just that things move on you. Let me let Mickey a version of what we just saw here in um, in Final Cut, similar to what we've been making. I'm bringing the same clips just to keep it consistent here. Yeah, where are you? Yeah, we'll do it here. That's fine. So you can import that way, or you can drag and drop. Um, okay, so this is the same, the same gist where I can adjust my, that is okay. Um, and Final Cut will give me a different kind of feedback based on where I'm trimming. I'm trimming the edge and it's showing me live where it's gonna actually start. And if I want to scale this clip, I need to enable the correct tab over here. So again, they're all the same, but they're all different. Whereas this one allows me now to scale that clip and move that clip same, with the same kind of control. 
The nice thing about Final Cut, though, is I don't have to like think through every single move in advance. If I decide that I was wrong about the order of something uh, that needs to stack in a different order, like I was here, and I just say, well, that's fine. I'll put you below you then. So you get what you pay for. It's a it's a powerful tool. It does cost, uh, you know, more money, but it's the it's the same concept of of being able to uh, layer these things, scale these things, and better guide my audience's attention. Uh, let me scale me down over there and bring it into view. So here we are. We've we've accomplished a very similar task, but in a totally different tool. So you could see same basic thing, but the stuff moved on us. Um, I'll show you Premiere. I already edited it, but I will not do it entirely live because I think you I think you get the idea. Um, okay. This is actually using different source. Yeah. Let me talk about that for a minute before before we wrap up. So everything you saw in all these demos so far were made with the built-in laptop camera. I did a version of this where I put my cell phone in front of my laptop instead and spoke to that. Okay. Advancing my slides. Filmmaking is creative and technical. I had a USB microphone plugged into my laptop. Both sides of your brain. My camera was about three or four feet away from me. And you hear it doesn't sound so great. And many of which... We need to think of this is the screen recording where it's hearing the USB microphone. Out of the phone, because that's where the camera is. Anyway. Hi, my name is Brian Stazzle and I am going to so, demonstrate. Sounds much better. Um, if you do use your cell phone, you can't be too far away from it, or it still might not sound so great. Uh, use the best mic you can in, in, on one of these. And in this case, the better audio happens to be on the screen recording. Um, now, if I jump back over to Premiere, yes. Often you get a different audio feedback. And then like, when you try to match two audio feedback, you know, a lot of things I'm having a lot of match it's like I speak and then my step comes out like yes what are like some of your tricks to make sure that your audio track you know let's say your audio track just from an external cord like load or something like that right yep and then, like you want to add it on to it yes let me show that's a that's a great question and I did want to show that before we ended here today so um now I'm going to show off a, a, a feature that's in Premiere to answer your question, but I'm assuming this exists in other things. It does not exist in Final Cut Pro, though. Well, I mean, most of them edit with video packs. If you can set the audio track to video source. Right. I now, I, I could say detach this audio, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and then work with it separately. Um, but I'm going to show you a... a an interesting trick here. So if, if both of these have the same audio track on them, one that's one that's good and one that's bad, I can actually say, hey, Premiere or new AI functionality that's going to be in every tool in six months, right? And it just happens to be in Premiere first because Adobe's been really good about uh, you know incorporating a AI into their tools. And I'm trying to draw this, drag the sequence in instead of the media. That was my mistake. Um, so this piece has audio. This piece has audio. In the old days, you'd have to find some place where the words match up. And that's the maddening thing you're talking about. And I've done that enough to get good at it. But it's a skill that I'm not going to need to know anymore. That, so like, let me just, for everybody who doesn't understand what's going on, let me, let me just play for you this out of sync clips. Which is just on a, a little tripod right in front. Okay, of so I just started screen capture. Screen like... Okay, so I just started. So in the old days, I would try to line those two things up. Check this out. You just say, "Hey, sources, I want you to synchronize them," and it's going to ask you some things like, "How do you want to do it?" For this situation, you tell it, 
look at channel one and synchronize the other audio to that. Okay. You don't, you actually don't choose these choices in this situation. So that's the main thing I can say now, but it'll analyze the two and you see what it did. So now, okay. So I just started screen capture. Uh, so they're so computer. good. You almost could leave it like that. And you have the good recording and the bad recording together and you can't even exactly. Or I can come down here and say, yeah, we'll turn you off now. I'm done with you now. So yeah, that's, that's wonderful. You do the final cut pro does not have this yet. Isn't that amazing? What does that tell you about Apple's uh, focus? Right. So like, that's like, so hard. Yeah. And I, and I've done it by, uh, by scratch. I, you know, like I said, I had to, I had to sort of figure it out by, by zooming in, finding some kind of mark, some kind of keyword matching them up. That's why in the old days you would have some kind of, because you'd find the clap sound on both sources. You'd match up the clap sound that was painfully obvious. Now they were in sync, but no one does that anymore. Now you just find like when I go, Hey, <laughs> or something, and you match up the two Hey's. Um, what's nice is this is also like, if, if the audio was good in the one you're speaking in, which I'm hoping 99% of the time for a pitch video, it is, you don't have to worry about this, but this was an interesting little side journey into use the better audio. And in this case, I, I, I made that mistake on purpose to show, like, if I have to, you could synchronize them and use them. But if you go looking for this, this in all the editing software, I don't know if it's there. I, my hope is that it will be, and I still can't believe that it's not in Final Cut yet. Um, well, we're, we're past 1.30. Uh, I should wrap it up there and, and, and just say, I hope that this was useful to you. If you are interested more in the content of the pitch, you can look at last year's talk, which I know Allison has an archive of those. Um, and if you have any questions about editing, you could reach out to me. I'm at the Robotics Institute, and I'm always happy to answer questions and teach this stuff. So... I mean that if you if you said, hey, I saw your talk and I just wanted a little bit of help, reach out to me because I know these this is like a crash course in this stuff. And uh, I would uh, you know just like to, to help you if I can. So with that, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.